Welcome to another Champion Braves video topic analysis. I'm Michael Norton, former PF debater from Falmouth High School, a former lab leader at NDF, the Harvard Debate Camp, and Champion Braves Institute, and the current Champion Braves Managing Editor. This month's topic analysis will be on the topic, Resolve, Single Gender Classrooms Would Improve the Quality of Education in American Public Schools. As a brief overview, some things that will be covered include breaking down the topic and evaluating what single gender classrooms are and what it constitutes for this month's topic, and qualifying quality of education and considering the definitions under the topic and what frameworks are very relevant under that. Next, we'll cover strategies and how to center your arguments within your cases around the relevant framework for your side of the topic and being prepared to win under your other opposition team's framework, despite arguing under your limited and a final word on avoiding sexism on a very important topic for public forum. So first, let's break down the topic. When considering a single gender classroom, there are a few things to look into. First, whether it's being defined as opt-in or whether students are being mandated to be in these single gender classrooms. Single gender classrooms in lots of parts of the country have been used on an opt-in basis, like in Idaho, where students were given the option to engage in single gender classrooms or engage in gender neutral classrooms. The reason this might be important is you consider that some students might be far more catered to single gender classrooms than others, meaning if an opt-in system is used, then that could be very beneficial to the affirmative, given that they can therefore advocate that students that are not well suited to a single gender classroom system do not have to partake. Similarly, the negative therefore should argue that single gender classrooms would not on balance be largely implemented in an opt-in basis, on a public school-based system. Also, one has to consider public charter schools and whether their efforts to create single-gender classrooms can be considered resolutional, given that it's public schools, and given that public schools, even though oftentimes do include charter schools, do not largely reflect the norms when considering strictly the impacts onto charter schools. So when considering quality of education and the impacts onto public schools, therefore, we have to consider what quality of education really means. So, Given that this is the mechanism of the topic, being that this is how we consider whether or not you're actually improving something, I think that all debaters should have this definition at the top of their case, in terms of what is actually most important in terms of educational quality. This can be defined by the affirmative or the negative as something like equality if one team is to believe that education is supposed to benefit everybody equally and is supposed to function as the great equalizer, or could be defined easily as performatively seeing that test scores and like tracking into better careers could be considered far more important and the purpose of education. The reason this is important is you'll notice once you buy the champion brief and evaluate the arguments we've placed in there this month, that disproportionately the affirmative focuses on test scores and focuses on decreasing the gap in terms of performance, whereas the negative focuses on discrimination-based harms and about how certain students do not feel comfortable in these environments and about how these sorts of systems encourage heteronormativity, and encourage discrimination. At that point, you can see that the affirmative is far more catered towards a performative-based framework, whereas the negative is far more catered towards a framework about how education is supposed to be a safe environment for everybody instead of just those students at the top. Some other important framework considerations include implementation. Now, you'll notice in the champion brief section on framework that implementation can be defended on the affirmative as not being required or on the negative as being required. The reason this is important is because if you add the burden of like requiring implementation onto the affirmative, they now have to justify that it will be implemented properly. The reason this is important is you have to consider how these sorts of programs are likely to be implemented. The reason this is important is, again, when you look to how these sorts of systems are implemented on a gender basis in the status quo, you see things like tracking being that in single-sex classrooms like female classrooms, they disproportionately focus on things like music and avoid topics like STEM, whereas when they try to teach STEM, the teachers oftentimes are not catered to the topic. Whereas in boys' classrooms, we see tracking where they don't learn things like the humanities and simply focus on science and math because, quote unquote, boys are simply better at science and math. Note the sarcasm. At that point, you have to consider the implementation and whether tracking will occur, but also funding disparities. Because note that oftentimes in these sorts of circumstances, we can't just expect that school districts will fund the same amount of money into the same programs for boys and girls. At that point, we can very clearly establish that single-sex classrooms can exacerbate discrimination not just in 
theory alone, but also in practice and how they're created. At that point, a good affirmative framework that gets you out of justifying whether implementation needs to be defended on the affirmative by explaining that you nearly need to establish the existence of single gender classrooms as a benefit will be very good for you, whereas the negative should claim that single gender classrooms need to be implemented and explained on a theory basis in order to get a holistic explanation of whether it would improve the quality of education. So next, let's talk about some strategic elements. So first and foremost, remember the frameworks that make sense on each side. Now, although the affirmative is probably more catered to performance, either side can run either framework, given that either side has argumentation on both. I'm going to primarily funnel the argumentation that we see in the champion brief section on the affirmative and the negative, and explain how they link into each side. So first on the affirmative, on the performance-based arguments, we see lots of arguments about performance gaps and about how in gender-neutral classrooms, we see gaps in education on certain subjects, like STEM education and like other subjects, including the humanities, reading and writing, etc., etc. The AF argument here is that when you separate the, separate the genders, you see less of a gap because the students therefore can learn in an environment that is catered to them and therefore is more likely to help them in those specific subjects. There's also a lot of argumentation about bullying and about how when you separate these two genders, you see less bullying. Be careful, how uh, however, to make the argument that boys are inherently more likely to bully or that girls are more likely to be bullied. Make sure that when you're on the affirmative, your arguments are based not just in statistics and not just in rhetoric, but legitimate warranting as to why boys and girls are more likely to fight at that age. Try to avoid any sort of boys are just more likely to be boys argumentation. Finally, under this AF performance-based framework, we can look at at-risk students and have certain students in these environments just don't function among other genders. And certain students simply have a lot of anxiety when they're put in this environment that's like multifaceted when they're in these sorts of gender-neutral environments. And they're simply far more comfortable in a safe space. Now on the negative, when focusing on the equality impacts, there are a lot of great arguments, particularly in the champion brief, that I think that could be great on this sort of topic. First on discrimination. So I think champion briefs writers did a great job this month on including a lot of interesting argumentation, particularly about discrimination against women, but also against discrimination against LGBTQ individuals who are considered to be, you know, not included under this. Because if the basis for single sex classrooms is that boys and girls are distracted to one another, it's heteronormative to claim that therefore no one will be distracted by the opposite sex, given that individuals can be distracted sexually by the same sex, which is why this is heteronormative. Secondarily, we see arguments about intersex children who are simply excluded by the system and have nowhere to go and are simply left out of their comfort zone. The same also applies to trans students who don't really define themselves under one sexuality. Next, winning under their framework. So under the affirmative, trying to win under the equality-based frameworks, there are a lot of arguments about protection from biases and about how in a lot of schools, there isn't a lot of protection against teachers and other students exhibiting bias upon certain students, and that when you get them out of these environments, they're a lot more comfortable to learn because teachers, like for example, in a lot of sexist schooling environments, are simply not going to provide the same opportunities. There's a lot of testing, uh, there's a lot of test score data out there also about how this helps girls in certain subjects and about how this helps them to learn, particularly in an environment when they're separated from boys because of psychological analysis and because of behavioral analysis about how boys are in the classroom. Again, make sure that this is linked into psychological analysis instead of just saying boys will be boys because they are boys. Make sure to avoid that. On the negative, winning under a performance-based framework, there's a lot of stuff out there about test scores, particularly from the NEA study that shows up first when you Google it, but also when you look to the decreased, uh, or excuse me, when you look to the fact that there's a lot of evidence indicating that there are no true cognitive differences among genders, and that the STEM education gap, and that a lot of these gaps are just fabricated or are just merely parts of the patriarchy that reinforce the idea that women can't learn science and math as well as men, but not necessarily that they actually can. Also, there's a lot of argumentation about college and real-world readiness, about how students who learn in these single-sex or single-gender environments don't actually get ready for the college environment because they don't understand how to function in these sorts of multi-gender learning environments, or about how when they get to the workplace, they're simply not ready to deal with it. The other argument that I really like is the trade-off argument about how when you put these individuals in single-sex schools, or single-gender schools, excuse me, 
you see that these students oftentimes are unable to get the same attention in terms of financing because we see that STEM education programs disproportionately get funded in the status quo. And when boys' schools are getting a lot more STEM education and are primarily focusing on it, then I think that you're going to see that taxpayers will draw money away from the programs they see to be less utile, meaning you see a lot less money going towards girls' schools because of the discriminatory aspect. Finally, the argument that's best on the negative and probably the most commonly run argument will be about tracking and about how if you separate boys and girls, this just decreases the incentive for people to teach boys and girls the same way. There's also an argument about teacher tracking and about how if one individual puts a female teacher disproportionately or female teachers disproportionately in female classrooms, this means that you see a lot of anxiety and this means that you see a lot of instances where you see a reinforcing cycle where individuals have math anxiety. This argument also is reflected in the champion briefs and can be easily run on this topic to great avail. Now, a final word on strategy. I think this topic is very challenging for high school debaters to avoid sexism. The reason being that sexism is not just direct and is not always intended. You need to always consider the implications of your actions and the implications of your words on those around them, not just when it's your words alone, but also when it's the words of an author you may be citing. Just because you are citing an author on a respective website does not mean that the author does not have some sort of hidden sexist implications and does not mean that this individual is not saying something that could be construed as offensive to many individuals. My advice to you would be to always second guess and always check and see if this could potentially be offensive or construed as something that is not based off of legitimate warrants, but based off of stereotypes about gender and stereotypes about what individuals ought to be doing. Just because it's not explicitly sexist does not mean it's sexist, and that is what I want to close on for this month's video topic analysis. Good luck to all of you with your state championships or national qualifiers. March is a great month to debate in. Good luck to all of you.